Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so again, software engineer at Bloomberg in New York City. I'm uh, one of the founding members of Bloomberg's data science community. Also the author of Hands-On Data Analysis with Pandas. And then I did my undergrad in operations research at Columbia University, followed by a master's in computer science at Georgia Tech. So today I wanna talk to you about why summary statistics aren't enough to describe your data. So if we start looking at these three data sets, right, these are very clearly different. No one would confuse them by looking at them, right? However, if we just look at the summary statistics, in this case, the mean in X and Y, the standard deviation in X and Y, and the Pearson correlation coefficient, you notice that they are identical. So if we have just used summary statistics and did not visualize that, how would you know it was the Python logo or the heart or the slanted lines? So what we actually need to be able to tell these apart is to look at moments, which are again more statistics, but instead of just looking at the uh, first moment, which is going to be the mean, or the second moment, which is the variance, which you can see is also the same, if we then take it further, and look at the third moment, which is the skewness of the distribution, notice that now there's a difference between X and Y. Sometimes you need to go even further than that in, in sequential moments, so maybe the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, whatever, to actually see a difference between the data. So if we add in the marginal distributions of the, the histograms on the X and the Y, we can give a little context to what these additional moments are showing us. So I've replaced here third moment with skewness. So that is the asymmetry in the distribution. So particularly if we look here, you see that this one's very asymmetrical because it has a lot of weight on this side, but much less here. And you can see the Y skew on this one is much bigger. Right? And so then also we can look at kurtosis, which is now the fourth moment. And that is going to be the, the weight in the tails. So these are all comparing things to a normal distribution. None of these looks much like a normal distribution. That's why the kurtosis is high for all of them. But in doing this, we've now moved away from looking at X and Y, how they move together. We've only been looking at X in isolation and Y in isolation. So if we want to look at them together, one thing we might look at is the correlation coefficient. And what we often do, if we assume that there's linear correlation, is we're gonna look at the Pearson correlation coefficient. Now this also, Unfortunately, that many people will use that co correlation coefficient even if it's not linear. And again, that's also a big problem if we're just looking at the statistics, we see a strong a linear relationship, but we don't actually see it, we can falsely assume that it is linear, right? And so here's an example of that. Uh, how many of you have heard of Anscombe's Quartet? Okay, some people. So this is the classic data set that use, is used to explain this, uh, even in an introductory a statistics course. So there's four data sets that were constructed by hand in 1973. You can see that, again, they all s share the same properties as the ones we started with, the same X mean, Y mean, standard deviations. And this time, the correlation coefficient is high. So this is, if we had just looked at these numbers, we would say, oh, these are linearly correlated. But if we actually look at the visual, right, only this one, one, and three are actually linear relationships. This is very not, not linear at all, but look, it's 0.82, right? So we cannot trust the summary statistic to tell us anything about these, right? So it's clear that visualization is going to be an essential part of any data analysis. And in 2020, there was an interesting paper called Hypothesis is a Liability. And the researchers showed that simply approaching a data set with a hypothesis may limit the thoroughness with which you're actually going to explore the data. So I wanna walk you through the experiment that they conducted. So they took students in a statistical data analysis class and they split them into two groups. In one group, the students were given a data set on BMI and they were told to just explore it report on what they found. And in the other group, the students were given three hypotheses, which I have up here, and they were supposed to evaluate those hypotheses statistically. And so you notice they're, they're given a direction for where to go with that analysis. And so this was the data. <laughs> so it's 
it's completely made up data in the shape of a gorilla. And the students who were given the task of evaluating those hypotheses were five times less likely to notice that they were analyzing the gorilla data set. Right? So this is, this is obviously <laughs> a huge problem. So how do we encourage students and practitioners uh, like to be more thorough in their analysis, to not fall victim to that kind of um, tra trap there? One way, I argue, is that we can create more memorable teaching aids. So one thing that happened in 2017, researchers at Autodesk made what's called the Datasaurus Dozen. So building upon that idea of Anscombe's Quartet, instead of just moving in, these are basic you know, shapes of lines and curves, actually moving into something that maybe is more impactful, right? So up at the top, we have the data source. So this is a, a dinosaur shape, and then they converted it into these 12 data sets. Again, preserving the summary statistics across all of those. And what's particularly impactful is that they also added animation, right? So now you can see that going from the dinosaur to the circle, we preserve the summary statistics, both at the dinosaur end at the circle, but also every arrangement of points that we encounter along the way, right? So there's an infinite number of point arrangements that will give you those summary statistics. So it's basically useless without the context of your visualization. But this brings a new problem with it. And if you, indeed, if you look when these things are shown on social media, everyone's like, wow, that Datasaurus has some special property about it. Like, that's cool that it also works for the Datasaurus, because it also works here. And now people think there's something special about those points, or even maybe the gorilla, right? And that's not the case at all. So what I set out to do by building Datamorph is I wanted to make it possible for people to build their own examples of this. So it's more impactful. Imagine this being used in schools, where now an assignment in the statistics class is to turn the school logo or a mascot or whatever into this, and just see that it's nothing special about any one of these examples you see online. And it's actually just any statistics. So no matter what data you're working on, you can't rely on just that. Right? And it's also repetition is, is good for learning. So data morph addresses the limitations of those previous methods, right? So Anscombe's quartet was one set of, of four plots. The dinosaurus doesn't has the 12 plots in the dinosaur, right? And also the animated results, but you can't make your own examples. And so data morph is an installable package that you can use without having to hack on top of research, research, uh, research code, which I did, so you don't have to. Um, it has those animated results that we just saw. You can have additional data sets, so we'll show an example of that, but built-in ones as well as custom ones. So if you have a CSV of points you want to use, you can use that um, with, with data morph. And so this now makes it possible for people to experiment to different data sets, but also different target shapes, right? We saw the ones that, the 12 that they added um, for the dinosaur, but we can also add arbitrary ones. So this means that we can make infinite number of examples now. So this is data morph. I'm converting the Python logo into a heart, right? Because we all love Python here <laughs> at PyCon. Um, and you can see, again, the statistics are preserved. This is in a different spot in the XY plane. These are different statistics than dinosaur. And this works. And notice the heart was also not in the original paper, right? So we can keep adding new target shapes as well. So here's the code. I'm going to dive a little bit into the code behind that. So first thing, we install. Uh, the data morph package. It comes with an entry point, so you can use the CLI, and that will create the same example that I had uh, just there. So we'll dive a little bit into a high-level explanation of what's going on behind the scenes now. So we have, uh, I'll dive through this example here. So the first thing is we have to start, uh, get our starting data set. And so in data morph, there's a data loader class. And that is what you can use to either load from your CSV or to load a built-in data set, which in this case is the Python data set. And data set is something specific to data morph. It is not just a data frame uh, in pandas or whatever other library. So it has the data, but it has stuff on top of it. And a big thing of what makes this possible are having these bounds. So you can see that there's three bounding uh, rectangles around this shape. So the innermost one, which is this one right here, 
are the data bounds. So this one is pretty obvious, just we're looking at it, that it's the limits in x and y of the, s the starting data set. Then the one in the middle, this one, are the morph bounds. So that tells the algorithm how far it's allowed to push the points away from where they originally were. And then the final one out here are the plotting bounds. And that's so we can keep a consistent frame in our animation without having any uh, movement back and forth. So here are the data sets that are, are currently available in the latest version. So you can see we do have uh, Dinosaur, right? We have the Python logo, which I was showing. And this was the one that started it all for me. So we'll talk a little bit about the Panda one later. And I do have some more coming in, in a future release that some people contributed at uh, the EuroPython sprints. So the next thing is once we have our data set, we now need to calculate the target shape that we're going to morph into. And so this is done with the shape factory. So the original research was hard-coded everything. If you are starting with a dinosaur and you want to go to a circle, the circle should be centered at this exact point. So in order for this to work for arbitrary data sets, there needs to be heuristics for how do you calculate a certain shape in two-dimensional space based on your data. And that's done, each shape does it individually, but then the data set itself can be converted into a bunch of different um, shapes. And so that's done with the shape factory. And so you can see at the top level here, I've taken the Python logo data set, and I'm showing over top what would be calculated as the target shape. And on the bottom, we have the music data set. Notice that the music one is not symmetrical, right? So it's taller, much taller than it is wide, whereas the Python one is symmetrical. And the heart does not get stretched or elongated, right? It still has the same proportions. Uh, it's centered in both cases, right? But these are different values because it's using the information from the bounds and perhaps some heuristics on the data to figure out where to place it using those heuristics. And that determines both the scale and the, the translation of the, the shape. So in the latest uh, uh, version, I have these shapes available, um, hopefully some more coming. It gets harder because the more they get more complicated to do uh, the shapes. Someone is working on a spade, which I'm pretty excited about. So as you can see here, um, th there is some commonalities, right? So we have like circles. You can see also points-based shapes and line-based shapes. And so this is all done with a hierarchy of classes. So instead of a bunch of if-else, it's done so that they're interchangeable, right? Because at the algorithm, all it needs to know is, I want to move this point. Is this getting closer or not? And that's a distance calculation. So the shape is the root of everything. It has to provide a distance method and a plotting method, mainly for documentation and presentations like this. Um, and then from that point, we can have those basics, the circle, the line and the point. So now if someone wants to come and add a new shape and they realize, oh, my shape is consisting of lines, then all I have to do is inherit from the line collection. And then notice I don't have to define anything specifically in here. I just have to say, where do the lines go given the data? And then everything else automatically is taken care of and it works with the algorithm. So once we have our starting data set and our target shape, we can actually do the morphing. And that is done with the data morpher class. And this works with simulated annealing. So this is largely untouched from the initial research. So what happens is a random point is selected. So that's when you see it glowing blue. And then it's moved a small random amount to a spot where it can still preserve those summary statistics. And that's when it shows red. So sometimes this actually means that the point moves away from the target shape. So if you look on the right-hand side, you can see that sometimes they're moving further away from the shape. And this is just part of the algorithm. This is a, a randomized optimi optimization algorithm. So you need this to avoid getting stuck at any given point in a, in a local optimum. And your likelihood of doing this decays over time. And it's called the temperature of the simulated annealing process. So regardless of how many iterations you run, it's going to decay throughout the, the whole process. So one thing I added on, on top of this was, personally, I find it more visually appealing when the points like rush out of the shape at the start and then slowly uh, settle in on, on the final shape. And so this is also governed by a similar thing to the temperature. 
so decaying the amount, the maximum amount that a point can move over time with that same kind of process. But here we cannot decay to zero, right, because then the points would not move at all and that would be waste of all the, the calculation. Okay. So I want to talk some limitations about the current algorithm as it stands and some areas for some future work. So the one thing I have here are bald spots. So ideally, we would like something like this to happen, where it perfectly fills out the heart not necessarily that they're all spaced like this, but that it fills it out perfectly. And then what ends up happening, as you can see right here, there's this big chunk that wasn't filled out. And that's because you know, all the points that are close to that probably moved up. These points moved up, these points moved down, because that was a little closer, right? So right now, there's nothing in the algorithm that entices moving those points further out, right? So that's one thing. Another thing is the direction of morphing. So I was very specific about saying we start from a data set and then we morph into a shape, which if you play the animation in reverse, then you're doing shape to data set. But going from shape to shape, so let's say diamond to heart, or uh, panda to dinosaur, data set to data set, those are not currently supported uh, because you have to figure out, well, which data set is the one you morph on top of? Where do you place it? How do you scale it? So there's a lot of extra uh, things that come into play moving away from that paradigm. So another thing is the speed. So as I mentioned before, the algorithm is largely untouched from the original, the simulated annealing part, and it's very iterative. So there potentially are parts that could be vectorized, although um, it is a little limiting because you do need to like move the point and then see where your where your summary statistics are after you've moved that ever so slightly. Um, there is someone from the sprint at EuroPython who did put in some PRs to speed up some other parts of it, but uh, so it will be a little bit better. But that is uh, a limitation currently. Another thing is that the scale of the data actually affects how many iterations it takes for this to. I'm going to say converge in quotes, and you'll see why <laughs> next slide. Um, so if I, if I scale down the dinosaur, so this is now half size, and up here it's double sized. So it takes tw about 25,000 iterations for this one, and then about 50,000 here, and about 78,000 here. Um, and that's because it's moving that small random bit each time. It's not a matter of all oh, just increase that minimum amount it can move that actually ends up leading and it get the algorithm getting stuck. So th there's other things that need to happen. But the quick way to make it work is you just scale the data down. It looks exactly the same if you don't force it to be plotted on this, this size, and then you, you solve that problem. OK, so the convergence, right? So the user has to specify how many iterations to run for. So this means that if your data set had the small values, like that the half size dinosaur, it might converge in 25,000, right? But you set it to run for 50,000. So the algorithm's going to keep running, and then you're going to have several frames in the animation where the points are just like dancing around the target before they're done. And so that's wasted compute power. Then you probably will end up regenerating it just to not have that in your animation. And then on the flip side, if you have uh, the large points, like the, the scaled up version, then you might finish your 50,000 and realize, oh, that wasn't enough. And then you have to do it again, but for 78. Right, so the goal would be to combine that maximum number of iterations with some sort of early stopping criteria. So detecting, have we gotten close enough to the target shape that we can stop? Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the lessons learned from doing this and then some of the challenges I faced. So the first thing is that repeating research is, is hard. Um, so the first step was I went and found the Autodesk researchers code. And I wanted to just see if I could recreate what they did. A lot of times there's some secret sauce missing. So the, the paper comes out, look at this, this is great, and here's the code, and then it doesn't actually, you can't get it to work. So <laughs> um, I, had, I wanted to repeat the um, conversion of the dinosaur into the circle. And what I noticed when I got a hold of their code base is that, first of all, there was hardly any documentation. I think maybe like one function had it, if anything. Um, there was, it was a partial code base. It was clear that they were like, ooh, we have to share this. Let's clean this up maybe a little bit so it doesn't <laughs> look that bad. And then there were things where I'm like, there's a function here, but it's not used anywhere. What was this for? 
um, generic variable names like A does this and setting this to a magic number and trying to figure out what all that meant. And so it took about four hours just to get the reproduction of the, the dinosaur to the circle. And then I, I was like, oh, I w now I can try my actual use case. So I wanted to include uh, an animation of a panda. And originally <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll get the panda to turn into the dinosaur. And we're still not there yet. But turn the, the panda into something else and use it in a workshop that I have on pandas. And so I made a pandas data set, which that was the easy part. And I, I reworked it so it had similar summary statistics to the data source, so I could figure out what the magic numbers actually meant uh, in the code. And again, some of the, the same problems as before, you know, detecting, oh, so this thing is actually the center of the circle, and that corresponds to the mean in the data set. Oh, OK, like <laughs> figuring that out bit by bit. And this took almost two days to get this to work. So again, just changing the data set, which had almost identical summary statistics to work for something else. So very clearly, it was not meant for interchanging at, at the level that it was, it was created. And then I got this idea, well, you know, I w I'm sure other people could use this kind of as, as an educational tool, as I had mentioned, right? And so I figured that, and I figured I also might use this <laughs> in other things as well. So I, I set about rewriting the code and converting it into a package so that it would be something that could be easily contributed to and also maintained. So this then led to a lot more things that needed to be uh, dealt with. So I had to clean up the entire code base, like lots of unused variables, functions. It's basically all in one giant file. And then I had to figure out how do I remove these if else, giant if else and spaghetti code and figure out how to turn this into something that made sense and I could come back to later like the hierarchy of shapes and how do I make this work for arbitrary data sets. And then uh, I wanted to, because there was no documentation at all, I was very specific about going the opposite direction and having documentation on everything. Um, so I made a pre-commit hook to validate that everything was in NumPy doc style. And that actually led to me becoming a core developer of NumPy doc. <laughs> um, and then I also had to figure out how to build and host my own documentation? How do I publish to PyPI and Conda Forge, building a test suite entirely from scratch? I think I rewrote it three or four times. Um, just because you, you get to the end and you realize, ah, actually, no, it would have been better if I did it the other way. But it, it's something that you don't have the, exp the opportunity to do unless you work on a project like this. So I, I would highly recommend er everyone find some project like this that they can work on. Um, and then also GitHub Actions. And it, it gave me a, a big appreciation for, you know, when you see an open source project that has come from just one person doing it, nothing, and then becomes something that's relied upon by a lot of people. Like, the amount of effort, you just to even get it off the ground is, is humongous. And so it took me about two months to then get to the point where there was something published on PyPI. And that was largely because I was scheduled to go on a podcast and talk about this, and I knew that it <laughs> needed to be done. So I think realistically it would have been more like four months, six months. So yeah, tremendous amount of time. But I did learn a lot, and again, recommended. So one other thing that I learned, <laughs> and I will share because I think it's important, a lot of times, you know, as programmers, we're guilty of not reading the docs. And you know, if, if something's going wrong, it's because you're not reading the docs. But sometimes, the docs are just plain wrong. And so uh, <laughs> I did find a couple cases where I was like, I, I'm definitely reading this, and it's, wor and it's not working. And I was able to fix either the documentation itself of an upstream tool or a tool that was using another tool that ended up not working. So um, yeah, so I just thought that was interesting. OK, so here I have uh, some resources that I, I found helpful for just going about this process and figuring out how do I do all these things outside of a company. And these, sh these slides will are on my website, so you have access to all of these. OK, so I want to wrap it up here. So again, summary statistics alone are never going to be enough to describe your data. You need to do this with visualizations, and you should not be limiting it to just one visualization. As we saw, even just adding the marginals on top of the scatter plot, the marginal histograms, added a lot more context to what was going on. Okay? And I encourage you to try out Datamorph. 
I accept uh, PRs as long as we talk about what you want to do <laughs> first. Um, and so you can, you can grab a picture uh, of how to install that, or you can, again, get it from uh, the, sl uh, the slides on my site. Here are the references to the papers that I referenced. And thank you. If you, uh, if you scare, scan that QR code, I have a feedback form, and you can let me know what you thought of this, and also links to my website, and feel free to connect. Thank you.